is. Wow, they want it to be on the album. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> and then when I'm done, I'll share it with the owl. I'm Pat Harvey with the select board. Frank Severy is next to me. Welcome to our last informational meeting. That's so much better. You should get a readjustment. As you all know, we're going to be voting. Um, it's already on your ballots that most of you should have at home. And uh, be sure to turn that ballot over because voting for whether or not to acquire the high school is on the back of that ballot. I'm only going to speak for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> this is the fourth informational meeting that we've had. And so this would be the last one. Um, so some of you may have already been here for others. Others, it's your first time here. So um, if a question was asked before, go ahead and ask it again. Um, this is the time to get all the information out um, for the project, against the project, um, and see how, you're, how, how your neighbors feel, how, speak how you feel. And um, that way, when we all go to the polls, we know as a town, how we should be voting, how other people feel about it. So we definitely wanted everyone to have an opportunity to ask questions and speak their mind. So this is, this is your last opportunity to do so. I think we're turning this over to Vic and perhaps Catherine as well. Um, and they will bring you up to speed on where the, the concept is at this point in time. Oh, good evening. Good evening, everybody. I'm uh, I'm Vic Robato. I'm the co-chair of the High School Repurposing Committee, along with Catherine Shankman, who's also here, and there are other members of the committee here as well. Thanks for coming out on a cold and rainy and awful evening. Um, if you're a Yankees fan, you'd probably rather be here anyway. So <laughs> they're not doing too great. Um, we're going to show some slides <clears throat> and um, share information, uh, take whatever questions anyone has. Uh, there are folks on Zoom as well as here in the auditorium. We want to make sure everybody has an opportunity to ask questions and, and be heard. Um, I will uh, start uh, the, uh, the discussion with the uh, slides. Uh, Catherine will Catherine will follow me, and then Dick, and then I'll come back. But before we get the uh, slides going, we have a, uh, a late-breaking um, uh, production from some of the kids from the elementary school uh, who have an opinion about this project and wanted to have that shared. So this only takes about a minute and a half. So here you go. Won't be visible on Zoom. Sorry, Zoom folks. Oh, I'm so sorry. I wasn't looking ahead of myself. In fact, I was looking at this building. I know it's been here for a while. I just wish it could go to better use. I'm okay, and that building right there is the high school. Oh, I didn't know this used to be a high school. I'm new to the neighborhood. Well, it's nice to meet you. And can I tell you more about this building? Sure, it never hurts to take a little break from running. You. You're a really fast runner. Oh, who's your new friend? Oh, this is just a person working on the high school repurposing project. Wow, that's really cool. Do you have any flyers? Yeah, here you go. Wow, it says the high school was built in 1974. But a couple of years ago, it shut down 2018. The repurposing crew came to life and now they are trying to put it to a good use. The high school will include a maker space, arts and learning center, adult day center, business incubator, early childhood center with child care, outdoor recreation center, and even a teen center. Wow, that's a lot of useful things in one building. Don't forget about the Clint Town Senior Center and places for businesses to rent. And I was just wondering, who owns the high school? The high school is owned by the Rochester Stockbridge Unified School District. Oh, so how can we support it? By voting to sell it to the town for $1 on November 5th. And spread the word. And if you want to get involved, please do. 
And I just have one more question. Who supports the high school repurposing group? We do! Okay. That's your entertainment for this evening. <laughs> I just want to say that it was a pleasure and Robert was part of this and Joe Schenkel was part of this. Can you use the microphone so work can get I don't here. So these five sixth graders from Andrew Fresh's class uh, contacted us and said they wanted to be involved in the project. And we said, yes, we don't have enough to do. We'll, we'll get involved. And so in a series of Fridays, um, three of us, uh, myself and then my husband Joe and Robert went down and met with them at various stages of creating their script, turning it into a film. And so I want to thank the kids for including us. It was a fantastic experience. You're all wonderful people. And uh, I hope your dreams come true. <laughs> thank you. Well, here's our agenda for this uh, presentation. Uh, we're going to give you an update on the uh, construction budget and funding sources. Catherine's going to focus on that. Uh, Dick will go into the, uh, uh, the phase one construction uh, as it's been conceived so far and something about the architect selection process. We're in the, in the midst of that process now. Uh, I'll come back and talk about the financial scenario, a financial scenario, um, Valley Hub Inc., which is the nonprofit, um, an update on PCBs, talk about risk and mitigation, uh, project schedule highlights as it stands today, and then open up for questions and, and comments. So, Catherine, you're up. So, um, for those of you who haven't been here before, quick review. Um, our feasibility study, which concluded in July of 2022 by Fairweather Consultants with GBA Architects, um, came up with a $3.5 million budget to do uh, the upgrade of the building. That included includes a new roof, new uh, windows, exterior doors, new HVAC system, new electrical system, and other things that were highlighted in the Black River study. Um, Let's, uh, so that was the budget that we submitted for the San Senator Sanders earmark. And based on that, we got the Sanders uh, $2,329,000. However, in 2024, we revised that budget based on current inflationary costs, and the whole project came to around $5 million. So we went back to Greg and said, we have to value engineer this, that's not a word that I knew at the time, but it's one that I've learned for the process, and scaled the project to something that was closer to uh, the funding that we got. And we presented that on September 4th, and that budget, do you wanna put that budget up? You don't, because it's, it's part of your slides, right? All right, Dick's gonna review that budget, but um, so, now we're at this point where um, we're, we're moving forward with the 3.5. We're going to focus most of the repairs on the uh, upgrades on the classroom side of the building because that's where we need, we need to be tenant ready as soon as possible to start bringing in revenue so the project can sustain itself. The West Wing, which is what you're in right now, um, will eventually be done, and that's called phase two construction. So our our fundraising right now is based on the 3.5 and we've been so so the Sanders uh, has a match requirement and that is through um, 
the USDA community facilities account, and that match is about 776,000. We have a community angel who has donated, well, the donation has actually gone up a bit, but it's around $280,000. We luckily discovered that a lot of our pre-construction costs can be used towards that match. So when we put those two figures together, we come up with $408,590. So we're closer to that match than we ever were. We're also prepared to do, uh, and we've done this before, uh, submit a CDBG grant. We submitted in June, and we were told that uh, our application wasn't competi competitive enough based on a lot of projects that are going on in the state right now, and there were things that still weren't entirely completed. So we're working to submit a pre-application in January and a final application for uh, the CDBG. Originally, we were asking for 500,000, but now we're going to be asking for a million. So that should bring us closer to our goals. Uh, if the vote is yes, of course, uh, then we're also going to be launching a capital fund drive. So we, uh, we have tenants uh, uh, who have signed MOUs, Memorandums of Understanding, and the good news is, is that the school district also wants to be an anchor tenant in the west wing of the building and be able to expand their arts curriculum. Let's see. I think that's about it. Oh, bottom line is that we're not expecting any money from the town towards the um, construction. We're trying to raise all that money. We've done pretty well so far in raising money. So, yeah. I'm Dick Robson. Um, our consulting architect, Greg Gossens, couldn't be here this evening, so I am trying to convey to you what he would have conveyed were he here. Um, this is the plan of the school. Uh, let's see if I know how to work this. How do you make it do its thing? Which There's all sorts of buttons. <laughs> this one. Oh, the top, the top one. one. Oh, okay. You are, you are here. <laughs> you came in here. Um, so uh, the plan is that this wing that we are in will be uh, uh, the theater as it exists, uh, maker space, and then uh, arts and um, computer spaces and a community room here, which hopefully would have a uh, community kitchen. So this, uh, this is what we are calling phase two, and the, here's the dividing line here between the two lobbies. Uh, phase one is all the rest of the classroom part of the, of the school, and here is where we would have uh, leasable space for childcare, for uh, various health practitioners. And uh, so the idea being that this is what we would do first to start bringing in money so that we can afford to do this. Uh, this is the, the conceptual budget as it now exists. You have to understand this is based not on an architect's design, it's on an architect's concept, uh, and that there are a lot of guesswork here, but it's the best guesstimate that we could get. Uh, and this, this would be for phase one, and the, these are by what we call in the construction industry the divisions, uh, construction divisions. Um, so the, the big things in here, uh, thermal and moisture, new roof, uh, new insulation on the inside of all the exterior walls, new exterior doors and windows. Uh, the other, the biggest item here is the mechanical and plumbing. 
It includes all new uh, HVAC system, heating, air conditioning, ventilating system, and those costs have gone up uh, tremendously in the last three years. Um, electrical is also a very large number. Uh, there's a lot of electrical work that needs to be upgraded, uh, including probably a new uh, entrance because we intend uh, that the school will be, uh, that this facility will be all electric, no fossil fuels. Um, we are now in the midst of the architect selection process. Uh, we had a, we've put out a, an RFP, a, a, a request for proposals, and on Friday we had a walkthrough of interested uh, architects and engineers. We had three firm, architectural firms and two uh, engineering firms uh, that were at the walkthrough and um, uh, GBA that is our, uh, has been our consulting architect is also interested and there's probably a fifth architectural firm so it will have a nice group to select from. Oops, how did we get there? Uh, so the, the process is they've had the walkthrough. Next week is the vote, the vote. Um, and then November 15, we're asking that their proposals uh, be in. And then uh, there'll be a committee that goes over those proposals and looks at references and so forth. And we'll give the select board um, their recommendation and hopefully the select board will make uh, their selection on November 28th. I want to talk about um, some of the finances the first thing I would like to do is ask everyone just silently to say to themselves, these numbers will change, because they will change. This is the uh, estimate as of back in, well, the last time of this meeting, September 4th was our last meeting. And the fact that we don't have an architect on board yet means that we don't really know what energy costs are going to be like. We don't know what the, uh, you know, the trade-off between electric and fuel and how much of the building can be economized with insulation and, and different energy system. And that has a major impact on the operating cost of the building. Uh, we're also uh, still in the process of recruiting uh, tenants for the building. We've been pretty successful so far. But this is a discovery process all the way, all the way along. And so, I'm, I'm hesitant to put any more recent numbers up there than what you saw in September because it's an evolving uh, animal. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I could be completely wrong uh, as more information is, is generated. But I'm going to just give you an idea uh, that what we're, what we're seeking to accomplish is to have enough rental income uh, to offset in time, the operating expense. And in this scenario, that would happen in, in year three and be great beyond that. Uh, it may take longer than that. Uh, the the cost uh, that need to be subsidized may be greater than the $74,000 number. It may be less. Um, it'll depend on whether, for example, we can occupy this west wing of the building with a couple of paying tenants, like the school who wants to be in here in uh, the fall, uh, like Suzuki the summer, um, and possibly others. And there doesn't need to be much renovation to occupy this wing of the building. Uh, need to have the heat on, <laughs> obviously. Um, but uh, you know, with a good cleaning, perhaps it could, it could uh, be occupied and, and begin generating rent. So we'll learn more about that in the next couple of months as we go forward, uh, get the architect selected, and with architect and engineering analyses, we should have a much better handle on this. And uh, we would be seeking um, some kind of support by the time of the 
uh, town meeting in March. So that's uh, an absolute deadline when we need to come in with something that's more reliable than what we are able to generate today. Just two other things I wanted to point out in this graphic. One is the annual cost of demolition bond repayment. Um, we know we have a we have a proposal for that and we have the analysis. That's $94,000 every year on out for 30 years. So that's you know, one way of comparing <clears throat> what the alternative is uh, to developing the, the building. The other point I wanted to make with this slide, I added a column here to just indicate the, the concept that um, taxpayers would be paying less school tax next year with this building not uh, being supported by the school. Um, so if, if the town property tax goes up by $74,000, the school tax in this scenario would go down by $31,000. So it's you know money going out of one pocket but coming back in the other pocket. So there's some offset. I'm not sure what those numbers are actually, and we'll have to work on that to get a better number, a more reliable number and, and that uh, people can believe and, and support. Uh, but again, I just wanted to introduce the concept. This, I'm not asking for people to fixate on those numbers per se. Uh, Valley Hub Inc. is the nonprofit tax exempt organization that's been formed to develop the building. Uh, and the intention is to take as much burden off of the town staff and select board as possible in terms of working this through and potentially to take ownership from the town in five years if that's what the town would like to do. Um, we are under a requirement for this, the money that the Sanders grant represents, that the town uh, would have to retain ownership for a minimum of five years before it could be transferred to another nonprofit entity. Um, we have been in discussion with Select Board about uh, a management agreement over the course of the next five years. And we just uh, agreed to just pause until this vote takes place. In no sense, you know, might be spinning our wheels. So if, if the vote is positive, we'd want to get back and re-engage in those discussions and have a, have a formal agreement. Uh, PCBs, we spent a fair amount of time at the last meeting talking about uh, PCB. Uh, just to, uh, first of all, I'll recap the high school. And um, Sarah Raitt, who was on the Zoom at their last meeting. She was unable to be here uh, tonight or on Zoom. Uh, but just to re refresh what, uh, what she said last time, uh, high school was tested in 2022 for PCBs in building material samples. They found one milligram per kilogram, that's one part per million, in paint and cove molding adhesive. The threshold for action is 50 milligrams or 50 times that. Uh, but more material sampling needs to be done this winter. Uh, she's begun the discussion with the testing agency, and they're going to come back and do some more materials testing, along with air quality testing. So what that refers to is in uh, 2021, uh, Vermont X-74 was passed, which established these age-related PCB indoor air quality thresholds uh, uh, for schools and that uh, any school building or any building with school children in it has to be tested uh, to be sure that uh, the school space being occupied by school children is below the threshold. And if it's not, then mitigation steps need to be taken. And those mit mitigation steps could be small, they could be large. We just don't know at this point. So uh, the whole high school building will be tested for PCB air quality and then, as I mentioned, further, oops, I jumped. Further um, uh, materials testing. Uh, we had hoped that this would get started uh, in October, uh, but uh, we learned uh, this week that it's not going to be able to get started until January, which is unfortunate because it puts the final uh, package of information in terms of results and a mitigation plan if that's required four months out, which means May. Um, we may be able to get just the testing results, and if it's uh, earlier than that, and if it doesn't uh, require mitigation, then you know that's uh, that's an endpoint to that process. But uh, at this stage of the game, uh, we just don't know. Who's paying for the testing? 
Uh, Two Rivers Wadakichi Regional Planning Commission is paying for the testing. And so, you know, what could possibly go wrong? Um, <coughs> Everything. <laughs> yeah, a lot of things could go wrong. This is not a risk-free endeavor. Um, and I've tried to identify just by broad categories and, and potential mitigation to address, uh, address them. So one, in, insufficient capital funding to complete phase one. What if we don't get enough money and the building uh, is, uh, needs to be occupied and, and at least minimally heated for longer than uh, planned? Uh, well, first of all, there is a 20% contingency in the construction budget. That's just a standard amount so that if construction costs go up while you're in the planning process, you can, or if you discover um, uh, things in the walls that you didn't think were there, there is some way of mitigating some of that. Uh, we could delay the construction contract uh, and full occupancy until there are sufficient funds uh, committed. Uh, West Wing occupancy could, in theory, proceed with just cleanup and without renovation, uh, which would generate some offsetting income. Uh, we could seek additional town support for operating costs if that becomes necessary. What if there's insufficient tenants to cover the operating costs and or, the, um, or if the costs are underestimated? Uh, there, a couple of levers could be pulled. One is reducing the capital reserves reducing expenses wherever it's feasible, increasing fundraising, increasing uh, town subsidy request, uh, consider pausing the project uh, or even shutting it down if it looks like the whole thing is hopeless. Uh, we hope it won't come to that, but uh, I think the, the range of possibilities is, is, is wide. Uh, PCB contamination uh, is a risk, uh, so seeking to get uh, current analysis of what uh, the status of PCBs is, uh, is underway. The work that was done, I just mentioned a few minutes ago, suggests that uh, the, the uh, concentration of PCB in the building is low, but it's not definitive, and so more work needs to be done. Uh, if the cost turns into be millions and millions of dollars, like at, at uh, Burlington High School, that tells you something, but if it tends to be a uh, very, very small cost impact, then you know, that's a different story. And if we go with the demolition option, uh, we know from the proposal and analysis that was done, that's 94 grand a year for 30 years and you're locked in. Um, and then the other uh, option, abandonment, uh, creates a derelict building in the middle of town, which would probably have to be torn down at some point in the future anyway. Can I ask a question? Sir? Did you ever look at lowering the scope of this thing as a committee? To Something that we requested from the board early on that you look at this as a scope instead of just trying to preserve the whole damn building that you look at just one aspect of it, maybe saving this part of the building? Mm -hmm. Did you ever consider that? Yes. Yeah. The, uh, maybe, but Dick, could you comment on that? The, the architectural and practical matter of trying to de if demolish half the building, what might that mean as in terms of the results? Well, it certainly would be possible to demolish half the building. I mean, it's, it's laid out. You saw that it has that connector that's the two lobbies. Um, but uh, what we'd be doing is uh, creating a facility that has little or no income. So we'd be spending a lot of money to upgrade this part of the building. We'd be demolishing that building at great cost and we would have very little uh, to bring in income here. So um, we did look at that, and we decided that it was a financial hole that we'd be digging. And it wouldn't be upgraded, and still wouldn't upgrade the systems here, heat, insulation, and all that. Yeah, well, um, we'd have to spend something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, project schedule. Were there other options that you wanted to have looked at? 
No, that was the only one I could think of. Okay. The other thing on some of your figures there, you're putting the town in a in a different audit state, so you've got to increase your figure from seventy five thousand to eighty five on that. That's a ten thousand dollar hit for the town to take on an audit for you know, federal monies. Okay. So that's another ten thousand that the town will the other issue I have is simply that if you're going to rent this space back to the school, that's all tax money too. Right. That comes out of our taxes from the start. So right. it's really not considered income, it's tax money. You know, so I uh, I don't know how that plays out, but it doesn't seem like that's an income based side that you can look at. It's just you know, we're paying it through taxes one way mm. or the other. Mm. But the school is getting then the kids are getting the benefit of it, so it's oh, not. Oh, that's that's certain. I don't. Yeah. You know, I don't argue that. Point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so current project schedule looks like this. Next Tuesday is the town vote on acquisition or not, and uh, project architect selection also in November. Project manager uh, to be selected in December. Town meeting in March will be. Uh, point of decision around whether to support the operating cost of building or not, and if so, to what level. Um, design at, to be at 80% in March for bid ready construction documents. April, as uh, Catherine mentioned, is the deadline for submitting a grant application for a million dollars of construction support. May, as I mentioned, a PCB uh, report on the findings as well as mitigation plans. So the findings, uh, I expect we would learn uh, before that, but if we need a mitigation, if we need to mitigate, then the plan wouldn't be out until then. Um, June, decision on the CDBG grant that Catherine was talking about. Uh, the rest of the schedule assumes approval of that grant. Um, June, uh, to have all the other funding in place, uh, in July, start construction, and in July, uh, classroom wing tenants could move in. So I think with that, Catherine? The purchase and sale agreement and when the Could you use the microphone, microphone July 1st, this would start the town right. obligation because until then, the school will continue to pay of the costs associated with the building. Right, right, thank you. Rob. Uh, could this, I'm uh, Rob Gardner from Rochester. Uh, could the select board or, or Vic address the town's financial capability of taking on this kind of project? And yeah. Uh, Vic and I have both been on the on the budget committee, but uh, could could we we've seen a, a profile here of cost projected costs and possible risks? Could somebody speak to the town's ability to handle that? Do you want to go back? Do you want to go back to the slide where it says what the town would be responsible for? That one. This is the slide that would um, estimate the exposure of what the town would be responsible for to support the building. Um, as you can see, the first year since the building is, will not be, it'll be in renovation, um, the new heating system would be in the process of being installed, um, probably not until the following summer. Um, that would be the most expensive because we would be supporting the building as it is right now. Um, from that point on, the building starts improving its efficiency um, with uh, solar, possibly geothermal. Um, the old monster heating system down the hall here um, would be retired. Um, therefore, it would cost less to support the building for its utilities. So the, f the following year, you see it drops down to about $32,000, so it easily cuts in half the second year. Once we get tenants in there, um, it's estimated that the rent income would sustain the building from that point on. 
this is what we're hoping. This is the scenario we have to work with. These are the facts that we have. We have no idea what's going to happen with um, inflation or you know what's in the future. So um, we can only work with the figures that we have right now, and these are the figures that we have right now. Um, so there would be uh, the town would be looking towards the taxpayers as an increase in budget for that first year of an estimated seventy-four thousand five hundred dollars in addition to what your regular town taxes would be. Um, this would be something that would be a discussion at the next town meeting for sure. Um, the purpose of the building, what would happen with the building, are we supporting the building? There could also be yet another vote about what does the town think about what the building should be serving the town as. So, um, it's a moving target still, but this is what we have right now. The first year, we're looking at $74,500. Um, the second year, $32,000, and then after that, we're hoping that the town doesn't have to chip in anything. Um, it is my opinion that at the end of the five-year period, if the project is sustaining itself and the Valley Hub nonprofit incorporated is ready to acquire the building, we would carry an accounts receivable with them until they pay that money back to the town. Um, we would have to obviously be uh, lenient and patient if, you know, with, with how they're operating and how profitable they are, non-profitable they are. Um, but it would be carried as um, a loan to the Valley Hub in concept. Um, don't hold me to it, but that's, that's the concept that I'm working with, is that we're loaning to the Valley Hub and when they get to the point where they can sustain themselves, stand on their two feet, and uh, carry on ownership after that, perhaps sometimes five years later in the future, so that would be 10 years down the road, they would be able to pay back the town the money that we lent to them to get on their feet. Does that help? If I could just, if I could, if I could just add to that, just, I want to remind people, these numbers will change. These numbers will change. So that may say 74,000 and 32,000 now, but as we get more into it, those numbers could go up. They may not go down. <laughs> they might go down, but they could go up too. So I don't want to lock, to please don't lock into these numbers because they are going to change. And this is, this is showing an intention that, as Pat said, the first year would likely be the most expensive because there's, uh, very little, if any, income coming in, but you have to pay to keep the building up in terms of the heat and electric and insurance and all that. Uh, the uh, indications are good so far that we would have more tenants uh, coming in in subsequent years and that uh, this uh, need for subsidy would go down and, and hopefully to zero uh, as soon as possible. Um, and as we get into the design process and know really uh, much more about uh, the ability to insulate and provide alternate and more efficient heating systems, that will have a big impact on the operating costs for electric and heat particularly. Amy. Uh, Amy Will, Rochester resident, um, Rochester Stockbridge School Board Chair. I just wanted to make a comment in regards to what Patty was talking about with the $74,000, um, that potentially um, would be added to taxes, please also remember at the same time that means that at least $31,000 will be removed from the school taxes because the, you're currently paying for this building through your school taxes. So that won't happen anymore, so you'll have that reduction there. So it is less of a hit can think of it that way. Shark Gardner, uh, Rochester resident. Uh, I am speaking into the microphone. Can you hear me? Closer. Closer. Okay. Uh, the next time that you provide numbers, I would like to see on the uh, demolition costs a line item budget of what that consists of and why and what the interest rate is and why uh, it goes for 30 years. So uh, is that possible? Sure. Uh, so we got a proposal from a company that does this. We haven't seen anything of it. 
Okay. <laughs> okay. We can send it around. No, no trouble at all. Okay. Sorry, I was just uh, referring to this lovely flyer that has been produced. Um, one of the uh, paragraphs talk about the demolition cost and that it's a 30-year bond at 4.5% yeah. and that it is um, to make this green grass, so then we have to pay for somebody to mow it. Yeah, we can certainly make the document available. It was actually it was obtained by the school uh, board to get an understanding of what that alternative would be. And we passed it to the town budget committee and asked them to consider or find out what it would be the cost. And the, and the information they got back was that it would be a 30-year bond at 4.5%. Now, this is back in the spring, I think it was. Uh, interest rate might come down somewhat. But still, um, that's the source, and we can provide that document if anybody would like it. Uh, one. <laughs> Make it the micro, Robert. Uh, the cost of demolition was 1.7 million, and then there was an allowance of another 250 thousand dollars for contaminants that, in case there was um, asbestos that would have to be taken out manually. And we know there's asbestos in a lot of places in this building, so I think 1.7 million is probably conservative. Just to clarify things a little bit, $100,000 raised by taxes is 10 cents on the tax rate, roughly. So if you do that to calculate for $200,000 of property, it's roughly 200 bucks increase. Right. Aisha? I, I want to just ask you, please, to explain what the tax implication on an individual property owner in Rochester would be with, as you explained it, in, as it was explained by the Budget Committee and Finance, what that would mean to an individual uh, property owner in terms of an annual thing if they owned a place, $200,000 or what, please. Yeah, well, Frank, Frank just described it. I yes, think. but in terms of property, because I think. That's what well, he did, he did. Yeah, I think the way I described it was, was just moving to decimal point a couple of places to hundreds to dollars per $100,000. So if you have a say $60,000 you're trying to raise, it's a dollar per $100,000 of property value. So $200,000 piece of property, if you're looking for $60,000, that's two times 60 would be $120. A year? A year, yeah. For that one, yeah. yeah. So that's yeah. a really important thing for people to put it in the context of their individual impact. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's not in the model, Whoops, I moved again. What we're talking about is each year individually. So <clears throat> would mean raising taxes for this year, and then it's, it's over. And then you go back to the uh, town meeting again the next year and say, can we get X dollars for year two? And if the answer is yes, then that's spent. And none of that carries over into subsequent years. It's not like uh, you know, building a, a bigger base year after year. So, Aja? Hi, Asha Kennett. Um, lived here for 25 years. I have four kids I'm raising and a business here, so I'm going to be here for a long time. Um, I guess I can only un imagine how discouraging it must be for this committee to constantly hear the burden that this project is going to be on the town. People asking, what is the burden that taxpayers will have? What is the burden to the select board, to the town? What about what this will bring to our town this economic growth, not only all, all these tenants coming in, but potentially families moving in for these business opportunities, families moving in because they see a more productive school. We have the school who's gonna hopefully come in and use this art space, which is, you know, not all schools have that opportunity. So potentially we have people moving in, we have people who don't live here but come to use our facilities, we have a re like, invigorated population saying, hey, we've got this big project happening. This is super exciting. Hey, everyone in Vermont, look at us. We're Rochester. We're making things happen. I don't see any of this as a burden. And we're sitting here haggling over $10,000, $5,000, and looking like it's doomsday. OK, yes, this is a lot of money. But this is going to cause such significant growth economically and culturally to our town. 
And it's very discouraging as someone who, you know, Vermont's population is aging, okay? We all know that. This also includes things for our aging population. This includes the Quintown Senior Center, but it's also about the younger generations. All of our generations are going to benefit by this. All of us. This is not a burden, in my opinion. This is a blessing. This committee has done nothing but improve the lives that we're going to have here in Rochester. A gentleman, no. I'm Mike McIntyre, and I don't see a thing good about this that's going to bring anybody into this valley. It, when they closed this high school, that ship sailed about bringing families in here to do, come to school. You have a whole bunch of numbers that mean absolutely nothing. You haven't got nothing firm. Everything's going to be it's well after the vote is done. There's nothing firm about any of this. We're just living on a dream that, oh boy, this is going to bring a lot of money into our valley and it's putting a load on us taxpayers. A lot of us can't afford the taxes we got now. I used to live on a 150-acre farm. We got 10 left because of taxes. We can't afford it. And this is just a pipe dream. The whole thing is. And you got to, nobody's got anything that's going to prove we've got an income. I haven't heard one thing that was legitimate that's going to bring income in here. And they talk about this daycare. Estimated daycare, 40 to $70 a day for one kid. You take somebody that's got two kids, if you take the average, that's $55 a day. If you're working 40, somebody's working 40 hours, they, if they can get $20 an hour in this valley, they're doing good. There's $160 a day. The government takes $40 of that, you got $120. How many people want to work for $10 a day? This is getting ridiculous. You've got all these pipe dreams, and you want the taxpayers to flip the bill for it, and we won't get a thing out of it. If you vote no, we have absolutely no risk at all. Absolutely none. Who owns the building? We do. The ro right. So we're paying for it right now. Stockbridge would love to get rid of it for a dollar. It's Sell it to somebody town. else. It's not their town. It's not their town, but they've got say in the building because they own it. They do. Rochester does not own this building. The IRSUD does. Yes, which is we pay into. We pay for this. Yeah. Stockbridge would love to get rid of it for a dollar. Yeah, well, why don't you sell it to somebody else? Or if it's such a good deal, why don't you buy it and you do the business and not get money from the taxpayer? I am a taxpayer. Well, so am I. What, since when has the town of Rochester become a financial institute for somebody that's got a harebrained idea? Every time we do the schools, oh God, this we do the schools. Money to run the school. You're looking at. Excuse me, excuse me. I have the floor now. You I got one too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We have schools. We pay a lot to educate our, our kids. Uh, let me tell you something so that, that will happen. I can't guarantee it, but we can't guarantee how many kids we have in school. Every, every year. It fluctuates, it goes up and down. We are looking at increase, uh, improving the school to attract more people, more kids from surrounding communities. We're, acti what? we're actively doing that. That brings in, if, uh, e each kid is gonna bring in nearly $20,000 in, in uh, tuition. You know, you talk about Hundred thousand dollars you're so worried about. Well, how about a hundred thousand bringing in five kids because we have good programs uh, allowed by this school by, by improving this place, and we bring in five kids, just five more kids, and there's a hundred thousand dollars. And if this fails, what happens? If this fails, 
then you're stuck with demolition. Either the, right. school, either the school is done, is is stuck with it, and we pay two thirds of that, or the town is stuck with it and we pay all of it. But yep. how much are you risking? You're risking a hundred thousand dollars a year. What's the worst? A hundred thousand dollars a year for four or five years? Can I just say, at what point do you consider any of it a failure if you have been able to improve this building with the upgrade, the, envel the envelope of the building, so that it is energy efficient, Mike, and the, and the proposal, the program fails, you will have a valuable building to sell. We'll have a valuable building to tear down for $1.75 million. No, why would you tear down exactly. a building that, that, why would you tear down a building that has value? I don't understand the thinking. Well, if it's got value, why don't you sell it to somebody else? Nobody wants it the way it is right now. Okay, but we do because the taxpayers are going to flip the bill. No, they're not. not just the taxpayers. We're having tenants coming in. We're having rent. It's worth a try, Mike. And Mike, I just want to say that I can validate. I read your letter in the paper, and I can validate your concerns. We're all dealing with post-pandemic expenses. I talked earlier about how the budget went from the 2022 budget to, to five million because of all the increased cost. HVAC just went through the roof. Apparently they're the new millionaires, installers of HVAC systems. I read that in the paper. I mean, we are dealing with unprecedented costs, but these costs that were, you know, that basically I believe came from a lot of corporate greed during the pandemic, supply and demand, chain, you know, chain supply things. We're dealing with that. We're all hurting and some of us more than others. And when I read your letter, my heart went out to you, and it goes out to you tonight, too. There is nothing about your concerns that, w that many of us in this audience don't also feel. But some of us feel that we can dream, and we can build, and we can take an, a, a risk that is shared by everybody to at least try, try to accomplish something that will be a town asset, that will benefit all the generations. That's what it is. And, and the fact that we even got $2,329,000 from the federal government, and how big is this town? Well, that, and that's, a, that's a pretty big earmark. I don't think it's going to come again if we go, goodbye, we don't want it. If we, if we say no to the whole thing, we ain't got no risk. Well, there are risks. There are risks about an aging town. There are risks about getting smaller and still having to deal with our debt because there's still the, the expenses that the town has to run. And if we don't have young people here who are working and who are paying into the system, paying into your Medicare and your Social Security, we have big fat risks. Who's going to, I mean, really, are they truly, $5 million dollar risk? really, truly, you know. There is real concern about what is going to happen to the older population if we don't support the younger generation coming in and being a working entity in our towns. Well, I went to school here and graduated in 71, and a lot of my classmates left and they never came back, and there's a reason for it. And you can talk to a lot of people in town, they're thinking of moving because they can't afford to pay the taxes anymore, and you're asking for more. Could we, uh, thank you, Mr. McIntyre. Anybody else? I just want to make sure everybody has an opportunity to speak. We have someone on Zoom. Oh, somebody on Zoom? Um, Justin, if you want to go ahead. Stover. I lowered it. All right, could we take someone else and come back? Yeah, you are on mute now, Justin. Okay, now you're on mute. But we can't hear you. All right, let's go to we'll someone else. Uh, Walter, I think you had your hand up next. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> in addressing my neighbor's concerns, uh, I respect the fact that uh, taxes will go up. Taxes have gone up every year that I've lived here, with few exceptions, which has been 48 years of paying taxes. Um, what Mike didn't say is his taxes are going to go up. And the reason they're going to go up is because if we have a no vote, we're going to have to demolish this. So rather than the little bit of taxes you're going to have go up, 
you're going to be guaranteed the $90,000 a year for 30 years. Now, you probably won't live that long. I know I won't. <laughs> but then you won't have to worry about it. But $90,000 a year for demolition is much less than the amount that the Valley Hub is going to be asking the town for for a couple of years. The maximum you could use as a Valley Hub would be 90000 a year. You can write it into a, an agreement with the select board. So you're talking about less than a half a million as opposed to two million to take it down. Anybody else? Oh, Dan. Yeah, Dan McKinley, Rochester resident. Uh, can you, I'm going to uh, make a sort of a statement, but then could you clarify for me what a no vote means? Uh, so looking at these numbers, as Walter said, look at the 74,000 and the 94,000. It looks to me that uh, it's worth an investment, a risk for us, for me, to pay Let's say if these numbers are right, 150 mm -hmm. extra dollars a year you know, on the quarter, $40 more a quarter. Um, I spend that much on beer easily. <laughs> uh, so you know, I, can, I can make some sacrifices to, to, to meet that, that need. It could be double that. Hmm. Uh, so, but still, I see it as investment for you know, a number of, of a few years at least, and we see if this thing will, will float on its own. And if it doesn't, then the, pull, the plug can be pulled, yeah. and we have a valuable asset. I don't know who would want to buy it, but uh, we have an asset um, to sell. So can you clarify what a no vote means, and does Stockbridge have any stake in that no vote? I guess I'd have to ask Amy to comment on that. Excellent. Um, so if, for the, if the town decided to do a no vote that they did not want to acquire the building, that means the building would continue to be owned by the Rochester Stockbridge Unified District. Currently, there was uh, money put into the budget that you guys approved to be able to keep the heat on uh, for this current year that we're in right now. That's why we're able to use this space. Um, the, t the school does not have any money to do any renovations in here. Uh, we hardly have money to keep it heated as we have for the past couple of five years. Um, through that, we actually, the, um, there was a partnership with uh, the repurposing committee to actually help support uh, the cost of the heating. Um, so a no vote, the school would retain ownership. Um, and going forward, I don't see um, a lot happening here. There is no money. Um, it would come back to the school to to decide and have discussion on it, but the discussion is that we can't support it. We don't have the funds, so um, we would not be in this space. It would start to deteriorate, I guess. And the grant money goes away. Yeah. Grant yeah. money goes away, and that's yeah. one um, very point. important piece to remember that, yes, there is this amount of taxes that are being asked for, but they were not asking for money for the whole project. Yeah, the the money for the project is being, is a grant money, it's given to us. Yeah, I think it's important to, to distinguish, as Amy was saying, the capital money being raised to renovate the building versus the operating support for a couple of years as on this slide. They're two entirely different things. Uh, they're not recommending that the town pay into the capital construction costs. That, were, and as was shown on an earlier slide, what's been requested so far is zero. What's anticipated requested is zero for capital construction. And if the town votes no, then the $2.3 million that earmarked that's been arranged by Senator Sanders goes away completely. It can only be used by the town for this project. It cannot be used to buy new fire truck or you know, other uses, good, important uses. A follow-up, if the supervisory union decided to demolish, that cost would be shared with the Stockbridge residents. Yes, and to be clear, it is not the supervisory union that owns this building. It is our Rochester Stockbridge School District. It is our school and the school down in Stockbridge that owns this building. Um, and yes, so if, the, if it was... Um, approved, voted on, it'd have to be voted on by Stockbridge residents and Rochester residents to what to do with this building. Um, and it would 
we would have to come to the to the residents for a bond vote um, to to be able to do that. But gotcha. The other piece of it is that, you know, we're all kind of talking about Rochester and Stockbridge, but we don't really know what's going to happen in the next few years with those two buildings. Like, there's a lot of discussion. You know, we don't even know if Stockbridge School is going to exist or if it's not going to be a combined system. Like, there is no guarantee that, yeah, you know, so we can't sit here and rely on Stockbridge because they might not even be, you know, it might be more of like a Hank, uh, Hancock situation. And also, you know, I'm a farmer too. I live on a pipe dream every day. You know, we're not making $10 a day making milk. We're not. We're hurting. The dairy farmers in this state are hurting, but we chose to come. I graduated from this high school and I chose to come back. My husband chose to come back. A lot of us chose to come back. And yeah, we, most of us farmers live on a pipe dream every day, but it's a dream I'd want to keep on living. Anybody else question? Comment, Mr. McIntyre. So, if it gets a no vote, what's going to happen? Well, I cannot speak for um, our, my entire board. We would need to make decisions, but it is the general consensus that we cannot put any more money into the school, and therefore, it would be un we would shut the doors, shut the heat off. Um, the slab would probably crack, the uh, pipes would freeze and burst. Um, it would turn into warehouser, I suppose. That would be a decision that would need to be made if the town, towns were able to, to, but something has to happen. And a vacant, a vacant building next to an elementary school is not a good thing. Vacant buildings, bring trouble um there it would of course be it would still be on um in the uh, we would still have ownership therefore we still have insurance that would need to be paid now i have a feeling insurance probably goes up with a, an abandoned building if the school district still owns the building, then it would be in the school budget, meaning Rochester and Stockbridge's school budget would, it would. It would, and um, I hesitate to speak too much of it, but I do not feel that that is very palatable to um, Stockbridge, and I think that that would put a lot of stress mm -hmm. on our current marriage. <laughs> Anybody else question? Rob. So uh, I'm very conflicted about this. I've been very negative about this project from the beginning. And I have to say, I pretty much agree with most of what Mike said. The problem I have, the thing that conflicts me, is that if we don't buy this building, it goes out of our control. We have no idea what will happen to this building. I don't think this is a very good plan. I think this is a there's a lot of wishful thinking in this plan. It's very complicated. In a business sense, I wouldn't want to put a hell of a lot of money into it. On the other hand, if you vote to buy the building, that doesn't mean they're necessarily going to do this project. Something else might come up. Other thoughts might happen. The thing might evolve. I don't know. I don't know. But I do know that if, if you don't buy that building, somebody else will, and it's a huge piece of property right in the middle of town. I just wanted to piggyback on that. Um, that a yes vote gives Rochester 100% deciding power of what they want to do with this building. 100%. If you vote no, you only have 50% deciding power of what happens with this building. And that's a pretty important factor. Um, as Rob said, this is, this is a plan. There is other options. This plan involves some pretty awesome renovations to this place to look at solar, geothermal, actually making it more environmentally sustainable. Could it maybe be retrofitted in um, another way that maybe is putting patches on the roof instead of a brand new roof? Would that cost less? Yeah, there's other options, but um, I think it is important that Rochester takes ownership of the building 
so that they have 100% um, deciding power of what happens to it. Dan? <clears throat> Dan. Uh, can you, uh, t you did some legwork around the adult um, care center and um, daycare center about what the need is and you had a survey that went out. Can you talk a little bit about what, what, what's the likelihood of those organizations coming in and yeah. paying rent? The, the survey was done several years ago and probably needs to be refreshed. I mean, some of those kids have aged out by now. Uh, Catherine? So actually, we, d we did send out a survey, uh, an extensive survey, to the um, older adults in the community. And we got a very high percentage of returns. And there was an enormous uh, interest in the Lifelong Learning Center. And there continues to be. I get asked about this all the time. Quintown Senior Center is actually signed on to become a tenant and with a, a new uh, kitchen in the former consumer science room that will be the place for Quintown Senior Center to have their congregate meals and also be able to take classes and also to enjoy the village, which is, they've, the board said, if they don't come to the center of Rochester where there's just more going on, you know, than, than up in Hancock. And there's also been more transportation issues related to Stagecoach, which used to pick people up at their door. And the oh, sorry. Anyway, there is significant interest in the older adult community to be in this building. They feel that uh, it's going to actually really revolutionize what the Quintown Senior Center can offer. Okay, so let me speak to the adult daycare. Uh, and during the pandemic... That was just no, child care. Oh, did you say child? Because we yeah. did originally talk about older adult daycare, too. Yeah. We just covered that, but you talk about child Yes, yeah, so, so Maureen Young, who is the wife of Jeff Gephardt, is uh, someone with a career in early adult uh, childhood learning. And she has expanded the vision for that from a child care center to be an early childhood center that with wraparound family services. She teaches early childhood education at VTC, and she'd like, and she's working on us being a satellite location for workforce development. And also we're putting feelers out to various uh, mental health organizations to have mental health services offices in the building. And um, when I say wraparound family services, that's more than that, but there's especially since the pandemic, there's been an incredible need for that particular kind of service. So, yeah, it's an expanded vision that's very exciting. And because Maureen is so well connected, and I've been on numerous uh, 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 Zoom calls with her, and she, she seems to know everybody that we connect, uh, she recently put a grant in, and they couldn't give her the entire amount for, uh, because we don't own the building. So they gave her $15,000 saying, as soon as that's a yes vote, you know, we'll give you the full funding. So, I mean, that's just, that's the kind of person she is. That's the kind of context she is. And, and it really is a huge boon for that aspect of this project. So, yeah. Mr. McIntyre. Um, I got one question. If this gets a yes vote and everything's good and the PCB comes back that is, isn't good, who's paying for it? Who's paying for the mitigation, the yeah. PCB? Yeah, look, have, look at Burlington High School. Yeah, we'd have to, first of all, determine how much are we talking about. And, right, and, but uh, it could and, be and, anything. And go, and go find money for it, not to yeah. town. <laughs> for the taxpayers again? <laughs> that would be, uh, we'd be looking for sources other than the taxpayers yeah. for that. Oh. Yeah, as it, we have for the other, rest of the construction. The, there's so many unknowns that you're asking for with no good numbers, and you know everything's going to go up. It has been. Hmm. There ain't nothing going down. So, Mike, I want to talk to you very specifically about um, PCBs, and as Vic said earlier, through our environmental assessment uh, study, uh, which was extensive, 
they found no PCBs that rose to regulatory action. So why are we having the building tested a second time? Because the school is going to come in as an anchor tenant. And so in the spaces that the school is renting, we are required to comply with Act 74 and, and do a deeper level of PCB testing. So yes, we also are going to have children in, this, in, the, in the classroom side of the building too. So even though, PC, ironically, PCB dis, uh, t testing is not required for children under preschool age, I don't know why, um, our group felt that we should go ahead and get that area tested as well. It just seemed like the ethically right thing to do. We also want to have a teen center, uh, and so uh, uh, Sarah Rate and, and Caitlin Bain from the Department of Environmental Conservation basically encourage us to get the building completely tested. They're going to be paying for it. They're going to be doing a mitigation plan. But Jamie Canarney, who's the superintendent, had the elementary school tested, and that was built in the same era, actually more in the area, era before the dangers of PCB were known, and so it found its way in materials. He had nothing, no PCB problem whatsoever. So I, do, I don't know the percentage. I think uh, Vic knows the percentage. It's a small percentage of schools that have actually had to deal with these you know, huge mitigation plans. We may just dodge the bullet here. We may not, too. There was no PCB f f uh, findings in the West Building at all, which is the, is the area where the school is renting. So. Greg, I think you have the next. Hello, um, I'm Greg White um, from Rochester. Um, a couple of comments. One, uh, oh, sorry about that. A, a couple of comments. Uh, I sit on the Budget and Finance Committee, and I know 70000 doesn't seem like a lot and seven, seven cents, but we have a ton of those type of problems we're dealing with right now. So it, uh, it, it's a challenge, right? Somebody had asked, I think Rob had asked, you know, what kind of condition is the town in financially to deal with this? And we just have those challenges in front of us. The question I have is, if it's a yes vote, can you describe the management agreement and how future decisions will be made going forward? Well, we've only dis started those discussions, so it hasn't really been resolved yet. But the idea is that there would be uh, a contract between the town and uh, Valley Hub, Inc. to uh, manage the building in the town's best interest, uh, to take responsibility for keeping um, the building uh, in good condition, uh, to handle all tenant issues in terms of uh, leases and complaints and everything else that goes along with uh, you know, an office building. Um, and uh, I don't know, what more might we be able to say? <laughs> yeah. I, I'm more interested um, sort of decision points. Will the select board be involved at each decision point as you move forward with the project? How, how is that gonna work? Yeah, we haven't gotten to that point in discussion yet, so we haven't explored that. But uh, we clearly we want to work in the interest of the select board, and you know, we can the select board can be as involved as they want to. But the sense that, that we have from the discussion so far is, you know, this is a burden, and to what extent can an organization like the HI take the burden off their shoulders, yet still have the select board retain uh, uh, authority because they are the owner. So, yet to be worked out. So last uh, tie, question tied to that, is, is the yes vote a, a vote to move forward with the project or is it just a, a vote to buy the school? I think it's, well, it's up to the select board. It's just a, it's just a vote to buy the school right. and then there will be another vote to It's just a yes, a yes vote will buy the school, but there's another vote to, to what, what we do with it later on. Not sure what that's going to be or what even the timeline is on that, but there should be some options that come out in that time and we figure out what the Valley wants to do.
but how does that go with the uh, timeline that's up there, that all of these uh, architects starting their work and that sort of thing happening right away? Yeah, so th those are uh, provisional. Uh, we do have funding for the architect to get started. And, and it's kind of a chicken or egg because we don't know, and we won't know enough about the building to really understand many of the cost implications until we get into architectural design. But, but architectural design takes a commitment to doing something, maybe not the whole thing. So fortunately, we have a, a donor who is willing to help make that happen before even getting to the grant funds. So we'll have more information. And you know, if there are other ideas that surface along the way, then you know, let's look at it. So what you're saying is, if there's a yes vote to buy the building, it doesn't necessarily mean that all of this plan takes place. Correct. Thank you. It does mean that if we are using that Sanders earmark, that we are proceeding with the plan to upgrade the building. I mean, that's why we have the Sanders grant. That's why we're applying for the CDBG grant. I mean, why would you not proceed with getting the money to upgrade the building? It doesn't make any sense to me. Oh, that's a sure. So, uh, I mean, this, this relates to my previous comment, which is I don't like this plan, but I don't want to see somebody else own the building. Yeah. Uh, what sounds like Frank is suggesting is that uh, decision number one is buy the building, and then there's subsequent discussion or planning or something that I don't understand, and then there'll be a town vote as to whether or not to follow through. So w has any thought been given of what this intermediate process is, where is the plan examined, do other plans come forward, or is there a different committee, or do we, see, it feels like this is a train in motion to me, and it makes me uncomfortable. You know, so we seem to be going to hire an architect and being committed to things. You can fix the building and use it for all kinds of things. I think I, it makes sense to me to buy the building, get as much money as possible, fix it as much as possible, and try to evolve it into a plan that's more likely to pay off. Um, so is there, a, is there a, a plan for this intermediate period? I would say that we've been working on this for four in years, and I haven't heard a plan from anybody else. I mean, I don't understand this idea of a new plan. When we've, we've developed the money, we've got things all in motion, I mean, why not give the plan a chance? Um, I would like to ask, is the, Pat, does Frank speak for the whole board? No, he does not. I was hoping to perhaps have maybe the, one of the last says. I'm listening to what everyone else has to say. And um, if that time has come, I will, I will give my little spiel. I'm kind of confused now on what the yes vote is. <laughs> Uh, We've been confused about Kind of confused of what a yes vote is. <laughs> According to Frank, yes vote is we're going to buy the building for a dollar, and then we're going to move forward. But it, does the yes vote include doing, taking the money that we have, um, that you all have worked hard to get um, to do the improvements on the building? And then, Frank, we have a dis discussion about what we're going to do with an improved building. Is that how you see it? That that's kind of how we derived that the whole thing as far as I understand. Am I correct on that? Vic, I mean, this was a lot of meetings that we attended and, and it came down to the point where were we going to just have a yes vote to do the whole plan or not? And we were under the impression at first that that's what it was and then it came out later that that's not what it is. So there was some difference of opinion and we put it out at a, as a warning that it was just to buy the building. And then after that, we'll go forward with another vote to whether or not we want to pursue this plan or tear it down or do something else. And when you say the plan, does that mean the improvements to the building with the grants that have been gotten? Go ahead. The grant money is coming to us to support a community center. So if we accept the, the grant money, which would probably come with a yes vote, there would be, the money would need to be spent for the community. 
um, like, like Catherine said, it cannot be spent on sidewalks or fire trucks, okay? It's, it's earmarked for a community center for Rochester and the Valley. So therefore, this is the plan that we have in place for a community center. Um, if some other variation of that comes about, yes, but we can't, we can't go outside the community center concept too much because that's what the grant money is coming to us for. Mm -hmm. So in, in essence, yes means we're gonna proceed with this concept. It's also a fluid situation because <laughs> I have been involved in this as well as Catherine and Vic since 2019 myself with monthly meetings. And it, it has been a fluid situation along the way. Um, bumps, uh, roller coaster rides, ups, downs, all in the same day sometimes. So when we get an architect in here and we find out that um, we have roadblocks, we could change the whole concept at that point in time. I anticipate the town meeting will have a lot of discussion about this building if the vote is yes. So there's a fluid situation in front of us. We don't have it in concrete. We have been looking for a concrete suggestion since 2019, five years. And every time we turn around, it changes just a little bit more. So at some point, we had to say, we need to vote on whether to acquire this building or not. That is why we are here, because so many people in town were saying, what's going on with the high school? Well, we had to bring it to some type of closure and get over this particular hurdle before we start jumping on the other hurdles. Now, as for how I feel about this, um, I gave this speech at one of our other informational meetings, and I realized as I looked in this particular room, and by the way, um, my children still live here, and my grandchildren live here, and hopefully my great-grandchildren will probably live here. So not everybody left. Someone right next to me didn't leave either. So <laughs> we didn't all leave. Um, there's a, there's a good community, there's a good viable community still going on here. And I do everything in my professional capacity to keep this town vital, alive, and growing. That's my profession. I sell real estate. I can think back in the 1970s when this building was just a concept. What a crazy idea to build one of the best high schools in the state of Vermont. It got done. I mean, everybody pulled together and said, does this valley really need this auditorium? No, but there was a dream that brought it about. In the 1980s, there was a dilapidated old inn on the park. It was called the Eagle's Nest. <laughs> It was closed down. Somebody had this idea about turning it into an assisted living facility. Well, what the heck was that all about? The building was so old, how could you revitalize something like that and turn it into a place where people could live? It happened. The town rallied around it. The concept happened. They survived. We give them uh, untaxable value to their, uh, they don't have to pay taxes. And it happened. This town rallied against it. This town has heart. In the 1990s, someone looked at Pierce Hall and said, what is up with that old building? Somebody else looked around and said, let's take a look at this building and see what happens, what we could do with it. And they turned it into a fine community facility with a fitness center in the basement. It was just a small shell of a building inside that the Masons rented they boxed off part of the inside of the building. You should have seen it compared to what it is now. Crazy idea, but it happened. People pulled together and made that happen. In the 2000s, someone named Tucky Crookshank came into our select board meeting and said, I want to hook up every house in this town to internet. I said, well, okay, he's off his rocker. Um, but you know what? It happened. EC Fibernet was born out of that concept and everybody said, sure, we'll keep, we'll keep supporting it, we'll keep supporting it. It happened. So here we are now looking at 
this facility, once again, did it come full circle? Do we need to revitalize it once again? Sure. Can we do it? I think we can make it happen. So I support it, and I support it to the point where it will become apparent that we cannot, and then I would probably be the first one to jump on the soapbox and say, we cannot sustain this. But we just don't know that yet. So I'm willing to walk through the darkness for a little while longer and find out when, the, when, it, when it clears, when the dust settles, we'll take a look at it. It may be a year, it may be five years from now, but I think it's worth walking down the path. Can I do a follow-up question first, Nancy? Um, a limited experience I have working with um, federal grants, helping landowners improve their land. You, you did the improvement, and then you had to maintain the improvement for five, 10, 15 years. Is there anything with that grant money that we're getting that says, once you do this, you better keep it going for? The, yeah, the one, the one limitation that uh, I'm aware of, and Catherine may be aware of others, is that uh, for the Sanders money, the town has to retain ownership for a minimum of five years. And if it were to be sold to a for-profit entity, if there were such interested, the town would have to pay back the $2.3 million to the federal government or the buyer on the town's behalf. Now, there may be other limitations. I, mean, I, don't know. I think we need some clarity from the source on that because we take that thing. Not five years or ever. I think we need some clarity on that source because Eric Law came down with our first uh, application to the air, earmark. Um, that didn't uh, go all the way through. Um, and he said that after five years, they don't really track it because they understand, they understand that there's uncertainty with all these community development projects. So it would be unrealistic for the federal government, you know, to punish us if, if something in good intent got started, you know, and it, and it you know, didn't follow through. So that's why we've had that five year thing that, you know, at five year point, the town can look to sell it to the nonprofit, the VHI, the Valley Home Inc. So, but I think we'll get some absolute specific clarity on that, but I'm not worried about it because Eric had been with the, with the USDA for a long time. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's any concern about selling it to a nonprofit with the intent of maintaining the same program. Uh, the question is if you want to sell it to a casino operator or whatever. Next to an elevator, that's a good idea. Next to an elevator. Next to an elevator. Next to an elevator. I just have case one, one question on Nancy Woolley. My understanding with all of this discussion, a yes vote releases Stockbridge from any further uh, involvement with this school, with this building. Yes. As of, ne as of next July 1st. July 1st, so starting with fiscal year 26. Yes. Thank you. I just want to clarify because I feel like I got your answer from the selectors. So when we vote yes or no, are we voting yes or no of buying the building and then we will there'll still be room to determine whether or not this wanted to do, or is this what we're voting on? Because uh, I feel like you two were quite specific. I the town asked, uh, well, people are asking for what we were going to do with the building so that they can determine whether they want to vote yes or no. So this is the concept that we're proposing at this point in time. Um, did you want us to just come out and not have any plan in the future for it and ask you yes or no? So no, I want you to answer the question, which is, are we going to vote on this plan? This is the plan that we're all standing by. Are we voting on just yes or no, and then there'll be... Uh, We're voting yes or no to acquire the building right now. Um, what we determine in the future about future votes and what to do with the building um, would probably be the next time that we have a discussion would probably be town meeting. But nothing in concrete will happen between now and then. We still have lots of testing to do. And when we vote yes or no, we don't get the building until July 1st of next year. Here's my answer. I don't like this plan. Not only that, as we heard that. House, the guy who made this plan, the consultant, he was uncomfortable with that plan and said it was not guaranteed. You know that I'm right about mm -hmm. this thing. This is not a home run, this plan. 
this is a very complicated plan. It's there's a lot of uh, I would say best case thinking in this plan. There's a lot of risk in this plan, and I don't feel, with all due respect to my personal friends that they just are on this committee, that that uh, they would look at it in the same way or with the same kind of hard nosed approach. So I, uh, what I'm asking is, if there is going to be this period of time, uh, and you can just say to me, you know, Rob, this is the plan. Get over it. <laughs> you can say that. Uh, but I thought to me, this plan needs more work. The, the committee is investigating and has interest from a lot of not, I'm going to say a lot, but other interests in this building. Those interests are not going to make a commitment until we own the building. So it's a catch 22. Um, you know, if we're going to acquire uh, other entities that want to make a commitment, we either have to own the building or not. Um, would you commit to um, paying rent to someone that doesn't even own their building yet? Um, so, no, I agree, I agree with you. so th it is. It, there's a there's a lot more to come. I hope and anticipate that there's a lot more coming to this. Then let me ask this: Would we assume that there was more coming to it that the same people in the same organization organizational structure? would operate that the, the development you're talking about, or is there going to be a new committee? Is it the board of this new entity that we're talking about? They have incorporated themselves as a nonprofit. So the answer to that would probably be yes. Yes, which? Yes, the Valley Hub would be the entity that would govern it. The select board in the town of Rochester does not take the stand to be a landlord. Okay, so is the Valley Hub the yeah, committee, so, or is it? Yeah, so it's... So myself, Catherine, Walter, who else is name? Sarah, Matt Tired, uh, Andrew Hirsch, Andrew Hirsch, Robert Mayer. So people who have been involved in the project mm -hmm. right now. Yes. And do you expect to get outside voices who might be more questioning about some of the legal issues? Absolutely. Yeah. We're looking for uh, more business people to join us. We need yeah. that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Comments? Sue? Uh, I'm just, uh, isn't there a... Right, the microphone. <laughs> isn't there a limit to how uh, long this grant is available? Five years. <clears throat> Five years. So we have time to, you know, sort through these things and we don't wait too long because the operating cost is, uh, you know, needs to be met with uh, revenue. Sooner the better. Anyone else? We're done? Um, select board, are we good to go? Or anything else? Zoom, any zoomers? Uh... I move to adjourn. Second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.